Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, the first webinar in the in the series of four webinars about the the fair data principles. Um, my name is Keith Russell. I work for the Australian National Data Service, and I am your host for today. And with me, I also have a Nick Theberger, and he will be speaking later. Just to give you a bit of background, uh, usual background about ANS and what's going on, uh, the Australian National Data Service, uh, we work with research organisations uh, around Australia to establish trusted partnerships, provide reliable services and to enhance the capability around the research sector, around research data. Uh, we work together with uh, two other NCRIS funded uh, projects, uh, that's RDS, Research Data Services and Nectar, and together we create an aligned set of joint investments to deliver transformation in the research sector. There you are. So this webinar is the first in a series of four, and um, what we want to do in these the series of four webinars is give a bit more background on the uh, FAIR data principles, and we've broken them up into the, the four principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So for today, the focus is going to be on general introduction to the FAIR data principles and uh, especially to look at uh, the first principle, which is findable. So the speakers for today will, that's me, give, I will give a in general introduction to the FAIR data principles and a little bit about uh, findable. And then uh, I'm very grateful that Nick Theberger has made, some, made time available to, uh, Nick is the director of Paradisec, to talk about how Paradisec has made their data findable. And uh, I think it's a great example that will sort of show what it means like in practice, because the FAIR data principles are quite high level in general, and I think the Nick can talk, speak much more clearly and give a much clearer example of what it actually looks like in practice and what findable can be, can be uh, how you can actually adopt findable and use it in practice. So, to start off, what, what are the FAIR data principles? So the FAIR data principles were drafted by Force 11. Now Force 11 is a, a community, an international community of, of scholars and li uh, librarians, archivists, publishers and research funders that sort of came together organically, started in 2011, hence the Force 11, and um, has been around ever since that date. And um, what this group, this community is look, looked at is to sort of facilitate change towards improved knowledge creation and sharing. And as they were working on this in 2015, they came together and they said, well, it would be good to have some principles around research data and the sharing of that research data and how, how you can best do that. So late in 2015, they drafted these four FAIR data principles and in early 2016 they wrote an article in which was published in Nature about it and from that moment onwards the ball started rolling and these principles uh, started to receive attention and uh, international recognition sort of this is actually quite useful um, I think a number of things to keep in mind if you look at the fair data principles and probably the reason why they are attracting so much attention is there uh, there are a number of things there I think one of the things there to to, to note is that they don't just look at um, making research data human readable, but they also look at making da research data machine readable. And uh, I think that offers a lot of opportunities into the future by making, by thinking towards the future situation in which research data is machine readable, can be harvested uh, by machines, can be pulled together, can be used for big data approaches, can be used for novel approaches in, uh, in exploring data and uh, knowledge creation and finding patterns and uh, different knowledge out of that data, I think it is, a, is an interesting step into the future. Um, another thing that's quite um, valuable I think about the fair data principles is that they are technology agnostic. Uh, there's, if you read them, you'll find there's no one recommendation to go with one specific technology. It's formulated in a way that different types of technology can be used to solve, solve the challenges. Uh, another thing they did, they've done quite well is to create a set of principles which are discipline independent. So the principles can be adopted across different disciplines in different ways and uh, meeting the needs of the specific discipline. Also, if you look at the, dis the, the principles, it talks not only about the metadata and it not, talks not only about the data, but the two combined and where, um, uh, where working on the metadata can enhance the visibility of the data, for example, or the reusability of it. So as you probably have noticed by now, FAIR is an acronym and it stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable 
and reusable. The R, reusable, is the one that sometimes re results in a bit of confusion. People think that it's actually reproducible, uh, but it's actually reusable. It's a broader concept. So just, keep, just to keep that in mind, we'll talk about each of those principles in more detail in the coming weeks. Before we move into the first one, findable, I have a few general pointers which probably are worth keeping in mind as we look at the fair data principles. So one of the questions I get sometimes is, well, do you want all data to be fair? And I don't think that is the case. I don't think that is necessary, and I don't think it fits in with research practice. Um, if you look at researchers as in the process in which they create research data, um, there are various steps in that process, and in some cases, um, huge volumes of data are being created out of experiments or coming off instruments, etc. These huge volumes of data can't be kept or stored in that original form. They often need to be manipulated, uh, analyzed, um, uh, processed, etc. So these huge volumes of working data are probably not suitable to be made, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, it's rather that data as it moves through those steps in the final uh, resultant um, uh, analyzed data is probably more suitable for that purpose. Uh, researchers also sometimes use scratch data to explore different experiments, explore different settings, see how things work. Not all of that data is worth keeping or worth keep um, using right till the end. Now there are also cases in which there are um, there's research with commercial interests, uh, maybe commercially funded even. Um, in that case, there can be arguments why, um, especially those commercial parties, are not interested in having any of that research uh, visible or public to the outside world in that they want to keep it quite to themselves that this research has taken place. This also happens in, in case of national security and defense research. So in those cases, it probably does not make a lot of sense to make any of that research data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. One question we sometimes get is, well, what about data that um, um, contains data about human subjects, uh, where, where there's privacy ethics considerations around the data? Should that data not also be kept hidden or private? Now, there is a distinction here between open data and fair data. So, in, open, in the case of open data, you're talking about making everything open. In the case of FAIR, you're actually talking about making it accessible through the appropriate routes, and that doesn't have to be open. So in, in the case of human data that refers to human subjects, uh, identifiable data, there might well be a very good argument why that data should, cannot be made openly available, but it can be made accessible through appropriate routes. In that case, it would still be fair because it would still be accessible. It, however, it would just not be open. We'll talk more, more about that uh, next week when we get to the accessible point. Well, what, what the fair data principles are not about, and this is something that uh, uh, very, only sometimes it crops up. Um, in copyright law, there's talk about fair use and fair dealing. That's not capitalized, that's in lowercase, uh, that's something completely different and that's not related to the fair data principles. Uh, one of the other things uh, I ran into recently was, um, uh, turns out that a number of market research companies uh, um, actually have developed their own fair data mark, which talks about how these market research companies treat the data that they collect as they're doing their market research. That is also lowercase, and that is completely not related to the FAIR data principles in capitals. One other thing that's worth keeping in mind is that FAIR is not an actual standard. So uh, some people expect to say, well, I, I want to make my data FAIR, and I want to make sure it fits all the boxes exactly. Uh, you'll notice well, as we start talking about the, the FAIR principles and dig into them in more detail, it's actually not that black and white. It is a set of principles. It's a set of ideas about how you can approach it and how you will actually approach it in practice will probably depend on the discipline. So uh, there's not one standard there for, that will work across all disciplines. Another thing to keep in mind about the fair data principles is that if you want to achieve, if you want to make more data more fair, uh, it's not just about the research data itself, but it will actually re require some work around it. So it will require a, a layer of underlying infrastructure, and that can be human infrastructure or technical infrastructure, which is in place, so that a researcher does not have to do it all on their own. 
but there'll actually be things in place that will make it easier for the researcher to achieve making their data fair. So um, things that you can think about there are policies around uh, making the data fair, procedures and guidelines that might be in place. Um, be great if there are tools or platforms or software in place that actually make it easier for the researcher to make their data fair at the end of that workflow. And finally, uh, it's going to be important to have the skills and the skill set available to the researchers, the research man the data managers, librarians, uh, e-research analysts, e-research staff, all the different staff members that are involved in that process to make it easier to make the data fair down the track. So I think one of the questions I get is well, why why is it now that these specifically these fair data principles are coming up and why are these being adopted so widely? Well I think for one thing they've got an attractive acronym. Um, I think the other thing is that it uh, covers quite nicely work that is already being done. If you look at them in more detail, you'll find that some of the things that are covered there are actually things that uh, that uh, organisations around the country have been caring about for a while and been caring about more and more. So some of it is probably not, it's less about a, a completely novel approach, but rather bringing it together under a nice acronym in a, in a, in a well-packaged form. Um, I think other reasons why it's proving to be useful. First of all, it's receiving a lot of international recognition. It's not just a national initiative. Um, if you look at the principles, there, actually, there is actually quite a lot of detail hidden below them and uh, quite useful detail. The fact that it is discipline independent makes it easy. It is not as hard a sell as making all data open. Um, the only challenge here, and this comes back to that point about the fair data principles not being a standard, is that it is hard to measure. It's hard to hold up to a list and say, this data is fair and this data is not fair at all. There is a more of a, a more of a scale from being less fair to more fair. So if you're looking at where fair has been picked up and in various ways, there's plenty of examples out there. I've just picked off a few here, um, some of them international, some of them national, some of them disciplinary. So uh, for example, in, in the European Union, the high level expert group uh, working on the European Open Science Cloud uh, sort of picked up the fair data principles and embedded that in their work and their thinking around what the European Open Science Cloud should look like. If you look at the Horizon 2020 funding program uh, by the European Commission, that's also uh, drafted guidelines for data management and in those guidelines they also use the FAIR data principles. If you look at the US, um, NIH has just um, set up a data commons pilot in which they want to explore what a, a cloud would look like for, uh, for sharing research data and there they're also looking at the FAIR data principles. In the Netherlands, uh, uh, initiatives have been set up called Go Fair, which is now reaching out to get more international momentum and more international partners. Uh, that's also uh, uh, a, a very interesting development in that they, they've, they've looked at the fair principles and also how, how you need different elements to support that, including cultural change, uh, training, and building an infrastructure to uh, make sure that uh, data can be made fair easily. In the UK, there's a currently a uh, project going on around uh, fair in practice and taking the fair principles and exploring what that means in different disciplines. Uh, the American Geophysical Union has just come up with a, uh, a project, uh, in, or I think it was only yesterday, the press release went out, that um, uh, what they were looking at is what it will mean to make data open and fair in earth and space sciences, exploring that further. And closer to home here in Australia, um, one thing you might have already heard come by is the Fair Access to Research Outputs Policy Statement, which was drafted and uh, is now available um, for support by institutions around the country. And the focus there is very much around research outputs in the, the ARC and HMRC definition, as in publications and um, um, uh, 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 conference proceedings, all sorts of publications materials, and how those how those materials can also be made fair. So that was a, a long-winded introduction, more in general, about the, the fair data principles. Um, what The one principle I wanted to talk about today is the first of those, and that's findable. And if you look at the actual principles and the way it's described, um, findable is broken down into four elements. So for the research data to be findable, uh, in the principles they say that 
the data and the metadata should be assigned a globally unique and eternally persistent identifier. Well, in practice, that just means uh, it needs a, either a DOI or a handle or a Perl, some identifier which is globally unique and eternally persistent and that there's an organization that sits behind it that cares about making sure that that identifier will resolve to that data set even when that data set would move. This is where that example of being technology independent comes up. It, they don't recommend one over the other. Any of those solutions works as long as that identifier is in place and it will actually resolve. Second heading there is that they say that data should be described with rich metadata. That's great. Um, however, they don't specify what rich metadata means. So there is this is one of those places where it, it, it's not black and white. Uh, is your data fair or not? What we'd say is make sure that there's uh, enough metadata assigned to uh, alongside the data, so it can be found uh, that it that it sort of answers the right questions for us from somebody that's searching for your data. The third heading talks about the metadata and the data being registered and indexed in a searchable resource. So there's different ways and several ways to tackle this and a number of number of ways to think about that is well having a search interface locally um, a database locally some way of making sure that your data collection can be found through a search interface but what we'd also definitely recommend is making sure that the data collections are the the descriptions of the data collections are passed on to uh, aggregators, national aggregators, for example, Research Data Australia, um, uh, but there are also other aggregators out there, uh, more disciplinary aggregators like uh, TURN. Um, they might go out into an um, international disciplinary aggregator like uh, OLAC, the Open Language Archives Community, yeah. um, and it could also be, um, data can also be published in uh, national, international disciplinary repositories like uh, Pangaea for Earth and Environmental Sciences or the, in the case of astronomy, for example, the International Virtu Virtual Observatory Alliance and the systems they have in place. So there's various possible routes to publish your data, but make sure that it goes into a place where it can be searched, can be found, and also will be indexed by search engines like Google Scholar. Finally, last point, and this really comes back to the first one, is if you're going to have a globally unique and eternally persistent uh, identifier for the data collection, like a DOI or a handle or a Perl, make sure that that is actually captured in the metadata. Okay, so that was the first, that was a quick overview of findable and uh, the way that they have described findable. Now, I thought it would probably be of interest to sh show what that means in practice and what it means like in practice to actually make data findable. And uh, I'm really grateful for that Nick's made some time available to uh, uh, to give us a short presentation about uh, Paradisic and the work that's been done in Paradisic to make their data findable. And I think it's a great example of how they've, in the course of several years and building up building up experience, uh, slowly but surely made their uh, the audio recordings more and more findable using all these different elements that I just described. So I'd like to hand over now to Nick, and um, oh, and one thing I also want to add before I uh, before I hand over to Nick is um, Paradisic has also done great work on making their data accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, however, uh, today I've asked Nick to focus on the findable side of things. So uh, uh, please um, keep that in mind uh, in his presentation, and, uh, and there's also a lot of other work that uh, Paradisic's done in those other aspects too. So um, I would like to hand over to Nick, and then uh, Nick can talk about finding in Paradisic. Great. Thanks very much, Keith. And I'd like to thank Anne's for their support of Paradisic over the years. So Paradisic um, has been running for some time, and as you can see, it's become a significant collection. We have uh, 31, most likely more than that, because it's increasing almost every day, but uh, around 31 terabytes of material representing over 1,100 languages uh, and you know 162,000 files and you know seven and a half thousand hours of audio so it's a significant collection and there's a huge uh, management task involved in that and one of those uh, tasks also is making sure that this material is findable by the people we want to find it we have a catalog uh, that we've been working on for a number of years. We've built our own, unfortunately. We didn't find one on, on the shelf that we could use. Uh, but the catalog allows you to um, look at material with uh, geographic point of entry. You can do uh, 
multifaceted search. Um, we have um, OAI, so Open Archives Initiative and Dublin Core based metadata. We try to be as lightweight as possible with the metadata because our experience, we're all researchers, I'm a linguist, uh, my colleague Linda Barwick is a musicologist, and our experience was that people just won't enter metadata if it's too complicated, so we've tried to make it as simple as possible and to make the catalogue do as much of the work for you as possible. So um, using controlled vocabularies, um, doing predictive uh, data entry, um, and uh, having you know minimal number of fields. As you'll see here, we have, uh, here's a, a screenshot of the catalogue. We have the possibility to make the metadata private. So as Keith was just saying, uh, FAIR doesn't mean that everything has to be made publicly accessible. Um, if you're constructing a collection, you can uh, keep all the metadata private and then publish it um, when you're ready. You can also assign uh, various kinds of um, access conditions, including you know, open, subject to normal conditions, or closed, subject to whatever conditions you want to specify. Because our um, project is really focused on um, language materials from small languages, that is all of the 7,000 other languages that are out there in the world, uh, we include uh, language identifiers for subject language and content language of items in the collection. And this is the linchpin that lets us then um, feed to a number of different harvesting services that I'll show you in a minute. Our online catalogue lets you specify geographic coordinates, uh, which then also allows you to search using that geographic information. Because of the work we're doing, we have lots of connections into the region, uh, in particular the Pacific, and we're actively seeking collections in the Pacific, um, collections of analogue tapes that need to be digitised, and you can see the various agencies there that we've uh, collaborated with and continue to collaborate with, uh, digitising hundreds of tapes and then putting them into um, the collection and making them accessible. So when, when we talk about findability, uh, we can talk about uh, the sort of granularity of finding. Uh, we can find collections and we can find items and uh, we should be able to drill down into the collection to find things that we're particularly interested in. So we can sort of characterise findability on a scale, if you like, from, from zero to 10. So if um, we talk about research materials, primary research materials that people have in their offices or in their homes, typically the findability of those things is about zero. It may be one if your colleagues know that you've done this work and you have these tapes sitting in your office, but a speaker of the language trying to locate recordings that you made with their grandparents, uh, they're not going to be able to find that material. So from our point of view in Paradisic, we infer that these records must exist because we know that the research has been done. So we can go looking for it. And then what we can do with that is we could add records to our catalogue um, pointing to analogue materials, and we do this in some instances. We also point at uh, websites that we know exist. So there are some fine websites that have language materials on them, but the websites might be transient. And what we then do is point at the Wayback Machine or the Internet Archive entry for that. So here's an example of um, a text that was produced um, in the Solomon Islands, put online by the uh, Project Canterbury, which is an um, Anglican archive, online archive, but it's a website. There's no guarantee of longevity. And so by us putting it into our catalogue, it then makes it available and findable via the search engines that we'll see in a moment. So there we increase the findability of that to perhaps uh, three out of 10 and using the language identifier. So there you can see the three letter ISO 6393 code for languages. Uh, in this case, it's LKN. What we've also done is provided images of manuscripts. So this is a collection of uh, papers produced uh, by Arthur Capel during his life. He was a professor of linguistics at Sydney University. When he died, he left a huge number of papers, uh, which we then uh, digitised. We just set up a camera and took images of all of these papers. And as you can see in the bottom right there, there are a lot of uh, handwritten original uh, manuscripts, which were really val valuable from a research perspective. Um, but, you know, sitting in a box in his executor's house, they're completely unfindable. So putting entries into the catalogue and we put this through the heritage data management system to put an HTML framework around it and you can then find these items um, and you know 
resolve to the level of the image. Now, you can't get to the transcript of the image because at the moment all that we have are images there. But one of the next things that we do to increase findability is to include transcripts together with recordings. So here's an image from our, our catalogue and what we have is time-aligned transcripts of recordings. These allow us to uh, play the recording and uh, you can imagine, because I won't show it to you, that uh, as the recording plays, it scrolls through that transcript. So this is increasing findability uh, significantly. You can resolve down to the level of uh, words and find them in the context of the recording. One of the other things that we do is uh, we embed some metadata into the header of the WAV files in our collection. We create a broadcast WAV format file, which is the European standard for archival formats of, file, of um, audio files. And you can see a little snippet of uh, XML there, which is extracted from our catalogue and inserted into the WAV file before it's all sealed up and put into our collection. Uh, we use uh, persist persistent identifiers um, of various kinds. The co because the collection started, as I say, 15 years ago, we have uh, an internal persistent identification system, uh, which is a collection followed by an item number. Uh, more recently, in the last couple of years, we've put DOIs through the whole collection. So we have DOIs from the level of each file up through items and up to the collection level. You can see also that we have Zotero and Mendeley integration. So that also makes things findable in that people will cite these items using this form uh, and they can uh, click and insert them into their uh, Zotero or Mendeley databases. We have an API. We have two um, feeds that we produce so people can uh, link into our collections. Uh, RIFSIS is at the uh, collection level and that's what's harvested by Research Data Australia and other services. Trove also harvests that material. And the OAI PMH feed is primarily targeted at the Open Language Archives community. So linguists have been very good at setting up um, services uh, based around these language identifiers and the OLAC page allows you then to look at all the material that's produced by any one of their 60 member archives for any given language. So it's a fantastic resource for finding information about the world's languages. And if we update an item in our catalogue, then the nightly harvest uh, from OLAC will update that um, OLAC harvest the next day. Uh, so as you can see, Research Data Australia um, takes um, a feed and, and produces it in interesting ways. So the, the benefit for us is not only that our material is more findable, but some of these services present the information in our catalogue in ways that we don't. So you can do faceted searches in some of these services. Um, and it also links into all kinds of other services and, and data providers that allow you then to do interesting new searches. There's the Open Language Archive community page. They have a faceted search on the right and a whole lot of services that they provide advertised on the left there. Uh, if you're interested in languages at all, uh, the, the, we're really the, the one-stop shop for finding uh, information, what's, what's in any archive in the world in their harvested system. Uh, this is the Virtual Language Observatory, which is a European uh, service uh, funded by Claren in Europe. They also take our feed and you can see that you can uh, search our collection through that. Um, service as well, and WorldCat, um, the um, international catalogue of all libraries also um, takes our feed. So that's sort of on the, the, the big picture side of it and international search engines. Uh, on the other side are the people that we want um, to find this material out in the Pacific and we've been working very hard to get uh, material available in forms that can be accessed by people in the Pacific. On the top right, there's a really interesting little project that was run in Madang where they took um, recordings and played them at a local market and asked people in the market to uh, comment on the recordings, perhaps enrich the metadata in that way. They then sent that to us in a spreadsheet which we were able to import into our catalogue. Um, at the bottom you can see a speaker of one of the languages who happened into my office in Melbourne um, and uh, went through the collection and found his grandfather speaking and he was quite amazed by, by that. So there's an example of how unfindable I suppose the material can be that he had to come into my office to find it and that's one of our big um, problems is how to make um, 
the material in our catalogue um, accessible to people who aren't perhaps always looking around on the web because they just don't expect to find material in their language. On the left, there's uh, a man who's working in our office in Sydney. This was a, an ANS funded project to enrich the um, PNG uh, metadata in our collections. And he's going through listening to material and uh, adding metadata where he can. So one of the other ways that we're promoting the collection is by building a virtual reality project. So what you're looking at there is a, a map of Vanuatu and each of those shards of light coming up represents a language where there's a little symbol there. You can listen to a snippet of the language which comes out of the Paradisic collection and you can see some information about how much uh, we know about the language, what, if there's a grammar, if there's a lexicon and so on and how many speakers there are of that particular language. Now this is generating a lot of publicity as you can see on the right. Uh, there's an article from the Papua New Guinea Post Courier and on the bottom right there's an article um, from uh, written about this in pursuit at Melbourne University and so on. Getting this publicity is important uh, exactly so that people will then go to look in the catalogue and find information or think about collections that they have that need to be digitised. Uh, so this is um, it's an investment of time and effort to build the virtual reality, but it's captured a lot of uh, public um, uh, attention. And it's also, you know, a, a research output in that it, it is driven by uh, well-formed data in the, in the Paradisic um, collection. We've automatically snipped um, 20 seconds out of audio files and used the naming convention and the metadata that's in the catalogue to then uh, feed this virtual reality display. So ultimately we do want to get this material out to the Pacific and what's uh, amazing really is that now most people in the Pacific have mobile phones and are accessing the internet. Uh, on the right you can see uh, a poster for the internet on your phone in Port Vila in Vanuatu. And on the left you can see a church but above the church there's a mobile phone tower which is now the way that people are accessing all this kind of information. So we want to make our material findable for people in these remote locations, uh, even in the highlands of Papua New Guinea or in the most remote parts of the Pacific. So the catalogue is, is findable to them through various means, including of course Google, but we also need to make the data accessible, interoperable and reusable for them, but I'm not going to talk about that now. So Paradisix um, created a standard metadata set that means that as the data comes in, it's described uh, with as a light touch, as I say, uh, we apply as much metadata to items as possible, but for some of the legacy material there's just very little metadata and we have to infer what we can. Uh, we also rely on people putting that metadata in online if they can or sending information to us. We are always open to enriching the metadata that's in the collection. The main point of the metadata is that you are able to then locate the primary records and have them played to you or see them or download them if you have the privileges. So. All of that makes it more accessible and findable and by publishing that material, the metadata through um, APIs for our discipline specific and more general search uh, tools, that makes it more findable as well. We do many things to try and publicise the existence of the collection, uh, including what may seem gimmicky, virtual reality or augmented reality, but all of this goes to um, increasing public uh, knowledge of the collection so that we'll, it, it will increase find, the findability but also increase uh, our uh, location of uh, analogue data that needs to be digitised. Part of all of this uh, also requires um, data management um, training uh, so that people know about how to build their own collections. So we do a lot of training uh, of researchers here in Australia but also um, in the Pacific and we also have a lot of engagement with community agencies in the Pacific and try to get funding to run digitisation programs with those agencies. So that's our story about findability. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for the presentation. I thought it was a really interesting example of, of how you've taken up the findable and adopted that, which is, uh, adopted that in a way which is relevant to the language community and relevant to, to audio recordings. Okay, so now you can see the resources on findable, hopefully. Uh, there's links here to uh, DOI, uh, DOI and handle minting service that ANS provides, a uh, link off to a, a metadata standard directory, uh, if you're looking at different metadata standards, what would be a good one to, to use that would be relevant to your discipline. Uh, there's a link off to the National 
Australian uh, Research Data Discovery Service, Research Data Australia, and uh, if you're looking at more international, uh, perhaps disciplinary repositories where you'd want to make your research data findable, have a look at Ruth 3 Data. Uh, an international initiative which lists all sorts of different repositories and parody sex in there too. Um, finally, if you want to have a bit of a crack at uh, uh, research data things, uh, we had 23 research data things uh, last year and um, there are a number of exercises there in which you can learn more about what does it make, mean to make your research data more findable etc. Well we've picked out three of those which are especially relevant to the findable space so if you're interested have a look at those three things and uh, see if there can things there that you might like to look at. So finally I would like to uh, thank you all for your attention and I'd like to uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the, um, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure um, uh, Strategy um, Program which funds ANS and uh, makes this all possible.